You've probably heard of this one. Stone man syndrome, the disease that turns people to stone. It sounds dramatic. It sounds memorable. But it's also really rather reductive. The medical name for this is fibrodysplasia ossificans progressiva, or FOP, which is what I'll be referring to it as in this video because the full name is yikes. What makes it extraordinary and devastating is a process called heterotropic ossification. That's when real bone forms where it shouldn't, in muscles, tendons, ligaments, the connective tissue that lets us move about. And this is actual bone with marrow being laid down by cells that have simply received the wrong information. Fortunately, FOP is extremely rare. A 2021 study estimated prevalence in the United States at roughly 0.88 cases per million people, which is likely an undercount given how often it's missed early on. Globally, we're talking hundreds to low thousands of confirmed cases. Most people with FOP, they're diagnosed in childhood, often after a puzzling swelling that doesn't behave like anything doctors have seen before. Now, the nickname Stone Man might capture the attention, but the people living with FOP and the clinicians who care for them, they prefer its actual name. It's more accurate, it's more respectful, and it keeps the focus where it should be, on the biology, the care, and the people navigating both. And like I said, we'll be calling it FOP today. All right, so there's a clue that appears at birth, which is long before the first flare-up, and that's the big toes. Now, most people with classic FOP, both big toes are malformed. They're short, sometimes angled inward, with the bones abnormally shaped or fused. It is subtle enough to be missed in a routine newborn exam, but specific enough that it should raise a red flag. When a child with these toes develops a painful, firm swelling in the neck, back, or shoulder, often after a fall, a viral illness, or just seemingly out of nowhere, FOP should be on the differential. The next step is genetic testing for mutations in the ACVR1 gene, which confirms the diagnosis in about 97% of classic cases. What matters urgently is what not to do. Intramuscular injections, vaccines given in the arm or thigh, certain medications can trigger new bone formation at the injection site. Biopsies meant to rule out cancer can seed bone in the wound. Many FOP families carry emergency information cards to hand to paramedics and ER staff outlining these precautions. Now, FOP is rare enough that most clinicians will simply never see a case of it. In that rarity, it creates a dangerous pattern. A child presents with a hard, growing mass in soft tissue, and of course, the instinct there is to biopsy it, to rule out sarcoma, to check for infection, to get answers. The biopsy comes back benign or inconclusive, but weeks later, the site seems to have ossified. The swelling was not a tumor. It was the opening act of FOP, and that biopsy just accelerated it. You see, early on, it's mistaken for aggressive fibromatosis, cancer, or inflammatory conditions like myositis. In one analysis, many patients underwent at least one unnecessary biopsy before the correct diagnosis was made, some enduring multiple procedures, each one leaving behind new bone. Now, this isn't about blaming individual doctors. FOP is so uncommon that it simply doesn't come up in standard training. The problem is one of pattern recognition. When you see swelling in a young person with unusual toes and a history of flares, the reflex should shift from biopsy to rule out malignancy to test for FOP first. The 2024 International Clinical Council guidelines are explicit. Avoid intramuscular ejections and surgical biopsies in suspected cases until genetic testing is done. It's a small shift in protocol with enormous consequences. In 2006, researchers finally pinpointed the genetic cause of FOP, this mutation in a gene called ACVR1, also known as ALK2. About 97% of people with classic FOP carry that exact single-letter change in their DNA, a mutation labeled R26H. ACVR1 codes for a receptor that sits on the surface of cells. It's listening for signals from a family of proteins called bone morphogenetic proteins, or BMPs. Now, in normal development and repair, BMP signaling orchestrates endochronal ossification, the process that builds your skeleton before birth and heals broken bones afterward. Cartilage forms first as a scaffold and then mineralizes into bone. It is tightly controlled, and it happens only when it's needed. The R26H mutation doesn't just turn up the volume on that process, it rewires the receptor's inputs. The mutant's ACVR1 becomes hypersensitive. It starts responding to signals that it should ignore, activating the bone-building program in places that should remain soft and flexible. FOP is inherited as an autosomal dominant pattern, meaning you only need one copy of the mutant gene to have the condition. But the vast majority of cases arise de novo, which is fancy doctor-speak for new mutations that weren't present in either parents. 
for years after the gene was identified. The question remained, what exactly is the mutant receptor listening to? BMPs were obvious suspects, but blocking them caused serious side effects. You see, BMPs are critical for normal bone health and blood vessel formation and more stuff. Stuff that you kinda need. Then in 2015, a team published a discovery in Science Translational Medicine that reframed the entire field. They showed that activin A, a protein that normally opposes BMP signaling, was paradoxically activating the mutant ACVR1 receptor in FOP. In healthy cells, activin A acts as a brake. In FOP cells, it ramps it up hardcore. The researchers demonstrated this in mice. When they blocked activin A with an antibody, heterotropic bone formation was dramatically reduced. The injury still happened, inflammation still occurred, but the abherent bone didn't form. And this was a conceptual breakthrough, and we'll talk more about it as potential treatment a little later today. All right, so how does this disease work in reality? Well, FOP flares don't follow a predictable schedule. They can be triggered by trauma, a fall, a bump, even something as minor as a flu shot. Indeed, intramuscular injections remain one of the most preventable triggers, which is why families often request subcutaneous or intravenous alternatives when vaccines or medications are needed. Dental work and surgical procedures carry their own risks. Any manipulation of soft tissue, especially in the jaw, neck, or shoulders, can spark new bone formation. The 2024 International Clinical Council guidelines emphasize careful planning. Use local anesthesia techniques that avoid trauma, consider fiber optic approaches for airway management, and coordinate with an FOP experienced team. When a flare begins, some guidelines suggest a short course of corticosteroids, typically started within the first 24 hours, and that may help in select cases, though the evidence for this is limited. Viral illnesses, especially influenza, have also been linked to flares, which makes immunization planning important but complicated. So, in clinical trials, researchers needed a way to measure whether a treatment is working, whether new bone is forming, and how much of it. And that's where imaging comes in. Lodos whole body CT has become the gold standard for quantifying ossification in FOP research. It captures the total volume of new bone across the entire skeleton in a single scan, providing a concrete endpoint that regulators and trial sponsors can track over time. But CT only shows bone that's already formed. By the time it appears on a scan, the damage is done. Enter 18F sodium fluoride PETCT, which, in case you haven't heard of it before, like <laughs> most people, is a nuclear imaging technique that highlights metabolically active bone formation in real time. I mean, why wouldn't you know about that? Even before it's visible on conventional CT scans. In theory, it could detect flares earlier, giving a window to intervene. In practice, the clinical significance is still being worked out, though. Not every PET-positive lesion becomes a problem, and the technique isn't yet a part of routine care. And also, these tools are research-grade. They're not routine surveillance. Families aren't getting quarterly whole body scans. But in the context of clinical trials, imaging has become the lens through which progress or lack of progress is measured. So, FOP is a progressive disease. Over time, flares accumulate, mobility narrows, and independence requires adaptation. The spine curves, the ribcage stiffens, joints that once bent become fixed in whatever position the bone locked them into. The most life-limiting complication is thoracic insufficiency syndrome, which is a combination of chest wall rigidity and spinal deformity that restricts breathing. The lungs themselves, they're usually fine, but the scaffolding around them can't expand. Respiratory infections become harder to clear. Pneumonia becomes dangerous. In a 2010 analysis, thoracic insufficiency and pneumonia were the leading causes of death in FOP. The same study estimated a median lifespan of around 56 years, though the data came from a cohort with a median age of death closer to 40, a distinction that reflects both the rarity of the disease and the evolving understanding of its natural history. Beyond the clinical milestones, burden of illness studies paint a picture of daily life, difficulties with self-care, barriers to education and employment, reliance on adaptive devices and caregivers. Families describe constant vigilance, every activity evaluated for injury risk, every decision filtered through the question of what might trigger the next flare. None of this is deterministic. People with FOP graduate, work, build families, pursue goals, but they do it while navigating a disease that does not pause and a healthcare system that often doesn't know what to do with them. So what's coming down the pipeline treatment-wise? Well, on August the 16th, 2023, the US FDA approved Palovaratine, marketed as Sohonos, for reducing the volume of new heterotopic ossification in people with FOP. It was a historic moment. It's the first drug ever approved specifically for this disease. Preclinical models and clinical trials, it reduced but did not eliminate new bone formation during flares. 
the FDA label specifies its use in females 8 years and older and males 10 years and older, reflecting concerns about skeletal maturity. And those concerns are significant. The label carries a boxed warning about two major risks. First, embryo-fetal toxicity. Parvaritine can cause severe birth defects, so contraception and pregnancy testing are mandatory for anyone who could become pregnant. Second, premature closure of growth plates in children and adolescents, which can stunt growth. Patients on parlavaritine need regular monitoring of bone age and high velocity. The drug received approval in the US and Canada, but the European Medicines Agency declined to authorize it after a re-examination in 2023, citing an unfavorable benefit-risk balance. That divergence underscores how differently regulators weigh the same data sometimes. And cost, of course, is another barrier. List price has been reported as $624,000 per year for a typical adult regimen. Ipsen, the manufacturer, offers patients assistance programs, but access remains uneven. Garatismab, the potential treatment that we mentioned earlier, takes a different approach. Instead of modulating how cells respond to signals, it targets the signal itself, Activin A, the rogue ligand that activates mutant ACVL1. The program has had a complicated history. Early trials showed signs of efficacy, but safety signals emerged. A 2023 paper in Nature Medicine reported results from the first treatment period of a phase 2-3 to three trial including detailed analyses of serious adverse events, among them deaths in the treated cohort, which is not good for a drug's approval. The study authors and independent reviewers conducted extensive evaluations to understand whether those deaths were related to the drug, the underlying disease, or chance in a small, medically fragile population. The conclusions were cautious, and the data sparked considerable discussion in the FOB community and among regulators. Development continued. In September 2025, Regeneron announced that a phase 3 trial of Garatismab met its primary endpoint, showing a statistically significant reduction in the progression of the disease compared to a placebo. The company's statement suggested the drug slowed disease activity and was generally well tolerated in the study. Those results have not yet been peer-reviewed or published in full, and regulatory filings are pending. The earlier safety signals haven't been erased. They're part of the context of any approval decision. Beyond palavaritine and garatismab, other investigational therapies are targeting different points in the FOP pathway. One class of drugs aims directly at the mutant receptor itself. IPN 6013-0, also called fidrocertib, is a selective ALK2 inhibitor designed to dampen the overactive ACVR1 signaling without broadly suppressing bone morphogenetic protein activity. Early phase trials have explored dosing and safety, development has seen pauses and restarts as data accumulates and strategies refine. Pipeline's a mix of cautious optimism and pragmatic uncertainty. Trials in rare diseases, they're inherently challenging. Small patient populations, variable disease activity, and the ethical complexity of placebo controls in progressive, irreversible conditions. And for the people living with it, it means building a care team that understand the disease and what not to do. Airway management is particularly crucial. Limited jaw opening and neck mobility make intubation risky. When surgery is unavoidable, awake fiber optic techniques and careful positioning are standard precautions. A 2014 case series on dental anesthesia in FOP highlighted strategies that balance necessary care with the imperative to avoid trauma. Fractures happen. FOP doesn't make bones more fragile, but falls and immobility increase risk. Interestingly, many fractures in FOP could be managed non-operatively with good outcomes, avoiding the surgical trauma that could seed more bone. Nutrition also becomes a challenge as jaw mobility declines. Soft diets, adaptive utensils, and attention to caloric intake help maintain weight and strength. Vaccination strategies have individualized, often favoring subcutaneous or intranasal routes when available. You see, words matter. Stone man syndrome might grab headlines but it reduces people to a single dramatic image, immobilized, objectified. The FOP community has been clear. Please use the medical name. The International FOP Association has been central to changing the landscape. They run a global patient registry that connects families, tracks natural history, and accelerates trial recruitment. They publish guides on talking to schools, employers, and medical teams about FOP. They fund research and push for earlier diagnosis. Educational resources like Talking FOP help families navigate disclosure, when to tell friends, how to explain the risks, what to ask of institutions. Emergency care cards distill critical information. Avoid intramuscular injections, consult before procedures, and here's how to reach a specialist. Advocacy has made diagnosis faster and harm less common. 
awareness campaigns have educated primary care providers. Data registries have given researchers the statistical power to design meaningful trials. FOP is rare, but it's not invisible anymore. The mechanism is understood. A single mutation that rewires how cells respond to injury, turning repair into bone. That understanding has produced the first approved therapy, paloveratine, and advanced other candidates. We're not at a cure, but we're past the point where there are no options at all. So maybe this isn't really much of an Into the Shadows video, because it seems there's really a great amount of hope. Thanks for watching.